So uh, I'm very glad to have a, a special session of the Fields uh, Mathematics for Public Health curriculum on these uh, beautiful sunny summer days uh, in Ontario, uh, at least in part of uh, the places I'm staying. And I'm very glad to have today's speaker uh, come from the Department of Mathematics and Statistics of Brock University, so Tora Ramazi. I, met him, I heard him a uh, long time ago for, uh, from my you know, colleague and uh, uh, from University of Alberta, where uh, Dr. Ramazi has spent his postdoc fellowship there, uh, I think is with uh, uh, Mark Lewis. And uh, before that, uh, Dr. Ramazi uh, has very uh, colorful training uh, in, with uh, uh, starting with a bachelor degree in actuary engineering from the University of Tehran, Iran, uh, followed by a master of science degree in system control and robotic uh, in, uh, from Roy Institute of Technology, Sweden, and then a PhD degree from, uh, in, again, in this area of serious and systems and control uh, from the University of Groningen from, uh, in Netherlands. And uh, as I said, he is currently a faculty uh, at the uh, Brock University. I'm very glad we have the pleasure of uh, engaging his expertise of AI incorporated into mathematical modeling of infectious disease modeling. So, uh, Tora, it's your time. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'll just be sharing my screen. Okay. Like, is it visible? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Um, in this talk, I'm gonna talk about uh, mathematical modeling of uh, disease spread and the use of machine learning tools. So I would like to start with a little perspective of what are the two main approaches used often for modeling disease spread. On the left part, we have the, me the mechanistic modeling approach when we want to model, for example, the spread of, uh, the spread of COVID. And uh, for example, we have their uh, ordinary differential equations, such as the, the well-known SIR model. So what happens in this approach is that usually uh, the a set of variables are considered and the dynamics between the, these variables are explicitly modeled. Now these models, uh, because exactly that we're uh, explicitly modeling them, they are quite insightful and they have proven to actually predict the near future, future quite well. Uh, however, they are, they are based on our prior understanding of the world. Right, so all these equations that we write down, uh, they are based on some prior uh, knowledge. So a little shortcoming with them is that they are only as good as that prior understanding. Right, so if if that prior understanding is up to a certain extent correct, or if it's wrong, the same applies to the result. And also, they they do not extend easily. Uh, easily to situations with unknown dynamics. So for example, if you have a process going on, you don't know how the interaction between the variables are happening. Well, it's really difficult to write down equations for them. And also if you have too many variables, then you need to make simplifications. You cannot really write down all the interactions between the variables, right? Uh, for example, one thing that happens that I will address later is the issue with uh, estimating the transmission rate in the SIR models. Often they're assumed to be uh, constant, whereas in reality, of course, they change over time. Now, on the right column, I have listed uh, data-driven modeling. Uh, they can be ranging from very simple models to uh, extremely complicated but deep learning. But here, for example, I have listed the uh, LSTM model. They are often fully based on data without any expert knowledge. So they have proven sometimes to be exceptionally accurate in predicting the future. I would say sometimes, not always. Uh, and 
well, they come up with some shortcomings, of course, they provide often close to zero insight uh, because they bear a black box design. And most often they are not interpretable. And of course, they're not causal. Uh, I don't wanna get into the details of causality here, it's a whole different topic, but um, uh, these are some of the shortcomings. Now, uh, I have met uh, with great mathematicians working on the left side and with great data scientists working on the right side. Uh, I myself are, I would consider myself as bilingual that you can interact with both sides, but I understand sometimes uh, the extremes of each, each side and the concern. So it often happens that mathematicians, they would not consider using any data-driven model because exactly of the shortcomings that they've listed there. They, they even say, how can we even trust this model? Uh, they're only based on data. And then I also see comments from the other side, uh, ex some extremes in the data-driven modeling experts. They say, why should we ever use any mechanistic model where uh, we can learn everything from data? In this talk, um, because it's a, at a mainly math uh, theme, I will see things from the left column, from the mathematical approach. Uh, okay, so I'm assuming that uh, we are looking at the work from the lens of a mathematician. And I wanna explain, first of all, why should we be using uh, data-driven models? And secondly, how to use them to improve our modeling. So the overview of my talk would be first to show the power of machine learning approaches. Uh, I will explain the data approach results and a package that we have made and uh, some concluding remarks. And then I will talk about how to bridge mechanistic and machine learning models uh, at the end of my talk in the second part. Okay, so I will use a case study, COVID-19. I don't need to explain much about it, just a little update. Up to today, we have around 540 million confirmed cases and uh, 6.3 million deaths updated today. The case study that I will be focusing on is the US country. So by today, 1 million deaths, 86 million cases. And these are the graphs of the daily death and confirmed cases. So the first part, uh, what is the goal? I want to predict the number of COVID-19 deaths and co confirmed cases in the US national wise uh, in the future five to 10 weeks. So it's kind of long range predictions, okay? Uh, and well, what data we have collected for that is um, mainly from March 1st to November 17th, 2020, uh, Johns Hopkins University data repository, Google reports for com uh, community mo mobility and daily summaries data set. And if you're interested, a county level version, uh, level version of the data set is available at this link. Uh, Good, okay, a summary of the data. Uh, number of daily cases, daily death, we're using these covariates or features. Uh, number of daily tests. And we try to provide a, an average of the whole country temperature and precipitation as a weather covariate. We also included mobility data collected from Google, including parks, transit stations, residences, workplaces, grocers, uh, pharmacies, and retail shops. Okay, so what is the approach we took here? Uh, first of all, we, we wanted to exploit the historical values of the data sets, okay? So in order to predict the number of deaths or confirmed cases at day T plus R, imagine that we are at day T or week T, uh, we wanna predict R weeks in the future, that is the forecast horizon, uh, we uh, will be using not only the data at time t, but also we will range back to uh, uh, for h, h previous values, so which we call the uh, history length. Okay, so how do we construct it? Uh, a little figure here, um, a single data instance with history length one, that is basically no history. Uh, so imagine that we are at this day, 14th of uh, February, 2020. Uh, 
the way we do it, and the forecast horizon is two. So imagine two days in the future. So the data instance that I will be using is that I will include all these training, uh, all these features, the, uh, the temporal ID, the uh, spatial covariates, the temporal covariates, I will put them here in my historical data. But then instead of the target variable, which was uh, the number of COVID deaths at uh, day 14, I will replace it with day 16. Uh, okay, so I'm forcing the model to learn from the information at time t, the target at time t plus two. Now, if I want to argument this with some historical values, what I will do is that I will add this temperature at the previous day. So I will just add it right here. And then I will ask the model not only use uh, temperature at time t, but also t minus one. And I can go back, like here, I think we, we tried like five, uh, up to five previous historical values. Okay, now data splitting. Two main points. Uh, first, okay, these may sound tr uh, trivial to machine learning experts, especially the first point, but I have seen that in, uh, in mathematics often the first point is uh, not taken seriously. A testing data set is needed to evaluate the model. Okay, if we want to talk about, if we want to compare the models, it's not the best idea to compare them on, on a, a training data set, that this same data set that you use for calibrating the parameters. It's good to put a separate data set to test them. Point number one. Point number two, this task is a time series prediction. So a random split of train tests or a k-fold cross-validation may not be used, okay? And the reason is we want to mimic the situation in the real world. In the real world, we never get to see the future instances. You can only use the data for the passing instances. So if you do a k-fold cross-validation, I won't be surprised if you will obtain misleadingly high uh, performance values. And this is why in some applications, I see that people even report like an accuracy of 100%. Well, it's just because that, that there's information leakage from the test data set. So we perform, so what is the solution? Well, we perform a temporal partitioning. So the test data is the single final instance. Say we wanna predict day 14, we'll put it there. We additionally added, now this validation training, you don't need to do that, but this is our approach that we tried here. So we also had a validation data set and that was the single pre-final instance, okay? The last, like day 13. And for the training, all the remaining ones could be used except for the fact that the gap data should be avoided that I'll shortly explain. Now this result, you see that we're not, so if you wanna predict seven weeks in the future, we're not taking all of that and train a single model to predict it. What we're doing that is that we will train a single model for every instance in the, in the test data set. And this last full partitioning forecaster, which uh, we called it LAFO PAFO, uh, this is the model that we'll be using. It's more an approach rather than a model because you can fit it with any model here. Uh, a little description of this data splitting that I was talking about. So you can, if you have all these weeks, imagine you wanna predict week 32, I guess the image quality is not, uh, high here enough, but I guess it is understandable, hopefully. Uh, we have week 32, we want to predict this week and imagine that we are here at week 23. The history length is three, so I'm allowed to use the previous past two weeks. So this is the box that I will be using. So the task is here, whatever model you use, you can use all this information and then you want to predict up to nine weeks in the future. Okay, so, Point number one, if you want to do this, if this is the reality, you cannot use any of these instance, the red instances here. Why? Because, well, they're using some information about the future, right? Uh, like any, none of these weeks will be, should be used. And this is what we call a gap data set. Point number two, we're using a validation data set as a single instance. So the yellow one is here. So you can use exactly up to here. And then all the previous ones can be used at train. Now this gap issue will not happen if you're using like a consecutively uh, reproducing models like an LSTM where you predict date 
t plus one based on t and then t plus two based on t plus one and so on. But it happens, it is an issue for models that the, the target value is some time in the future. Uh, another illustration, if you have your data set as a table where the temporal IDs are uh, listed here, say day one up to 27 and then 28, 29, um, this is the gap based on the forecast horizon. You should not use this. All the remaining previous ones can be used as the train and all the after ones can be used as the test. Okay, so what model did we use? Uh, we used, I would say, probably the most simplest model that one can ever use, or at least one of the simplest ones, the K nearest neighbor. Uh, what does it do? Uh, if for those of you who are not familiar with it, it will just look at the training data set and find then the most similar instance or instances to the one that you're asking for in the test. And then it will average out the target values to, to get the result for the test. So it's just simply averaging the similar instances in your train to get that one in the output. How many would you average? Well, that is de determined by the K here, this K nearest neighbor. So number of parameters, one, okay? And uh, well, we use the MRMR to rank the features. And uh, again, to emphasize a different model setting was allowed to be obtained for predicting each testing data instance. So meaning that a different K could be used for each instance in the test data set. Here are the results. Okay, so predicting the number of deaths for over seven weeks and in the X axis here you see predicting the future five, six, seven, up to 10 weeks. And then on the Y axis, we have uh, the error, the prediction error, mean, uh, mean average percentage error or MAP. Now the purple one is our model, the LAFOPACO, and the other ones are all the mod models at, uh, in the CDC website of uh, predicting US. Now, you see overall it's doing better, um, but it's doing better than what? Like this is, I would say it's a, it's very uh, like thoughtful uh, with like considerable result in the sense that by just averaging out, this model is performing better than LSTMs than probably like you can, yeah, you see the list of some like SCRR model. I mean, this is not, an LSTM with like, or a CNN model with uh, hundreds of neurons or an, an SI or 20 dimensional SIR model. No, it just has a single model and look at the performance. Uh, even if we forget about the comparison, uh, it, it's getting like an average error of 20 or 10% predicting two months in the future, two, two and a half months in the future. And uh, for the cases, well, the error were worse but still it's uh, overall outperforming the other models. Uh, well, is, is it guaranteed that this will work always for every data set for every week? No, of course not. And that's a shortcoming with many of the data driven models, but at least this is what we have for these weeks. So, uh, and also you may ask, okay, uh, this is a, a time series prediction. For example, that the blue one is the reported one, and the, the orange one is the LAFOPAFO. So if we were here at August 1st and we were asked to make a future five week predictions, then we, we could predict the number of uh, deaths with this error. And at that same time, we could predict that the number of deaths at 10 weeks in the future would be this much. Okay. Uh, people often say that, well, uh, you know, these models are incapable of capturing a periodicity. You see here that it's uh, for future, predicting the future two weeks daily forecast, it can still capture that periodicity, uh, which many of the SIR models cannot. And well, I know like, uh, again, based on my interactions with uh, some mathematical biologists, uh, experts, they, they may say, well, it's just a try and error, right? So for this model, it worked, uh, for this data set, it worked, but um, you just tried out this partitioning, temporal partitioning, it's not necessarily 
um, an intuition behind it. Okay, for answering that, we, we tried out this thing. So we, we believe that our model is benefiting from several components. So each time we took out that component out of the training and then we tested the results. So first we said, uh, instead of a, a single model for every week, let's just try out a, a whole a single model for the whole data set. Second, we said, uh, instead of the 11 features, let's just use the number of death. Third, we said, instead of this last fold partitioning, temporal partitioning, let's use 30% of the trained data set was uh, whole, used as the validation. And then last, let's use cross validation. Uh, one of them was like cross validation here. Uh, here is the result. So, uh, like you see, the laugh of half overall has the, the lowest error. And if you change any of these ingredients of the modeling, the error will just get worse. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I would say that this is supporting the fact of how, that the way this, uh, this approach, this modeling approach was used. And uh, we later extended the, this coding, all the codes are available online and we put it into an automated spatial temporal Python package called the SD predict, which you can easily install using this single line command. The package is quite automated in the sense that you can use a single command to do pre-processing uh, data, uh, uh, choosing from different models, uh, like even predefined models, uh, user-defined models, and then it will automatically do all the predictions. So what did we learn from this first part? Complex machine learning models are not necessarily the best for first choice in predicting a disease spread. Well, this is not, I guess, a, a bullet point for mathematicians, but for, for more for the data scientists. But also, even if anyone in general want to try out a machine learning model, it's not suggested that, that you run into a super complicated deep learning model. No, first try out simple models. Okay, and all, second, it is more about the training than the choice of the model, okay? So, and by that, I would suggest that avoid cross-validation for spatial temporal predictions. This is a must practice for train tests, but it is suggested only for train validation, if you wanna do any train validation. Avoid random splitting for the same reason. Omit the gap data if it happens. Consider developing a separate model uh, for each of the instances in the testing model, in the testing data set and exploit the historical values. Okay, some tips that you can consider when you wanna use the machine learning model. Okay, uh, in the next part, so I hope I have provided some convincing or a little convincing uh, at least the argument for why should you consider using machine learning approaches? I try to exhibit the, uh, uh, the, the potential power in these models, not super complicated, but just a very simple one. Second, uh, but yes, I'm also a mathematician. I understand why we use mechanistic models because of their great insights and many other great advantages they have. But can we somehow bridge between the two models and exploit the good uh, of the two worlds? And this is what I wanna talk in the second part of my talk. So the goal is similar to the previous one, just that here we focus on the daily uh, cases. Uh, uh, yeah, one of the reasons why we, in the previous work, we focused on the long range predictions was that, well, for the short range, SIR models did a pretty good job at predicting the future one or two weeks, but they failed for the long range predictions. Uh, so if we wanna predict like say, four weeks in the future, for example, or five here. Uh, we know that SIR models can be used, but you know they require this transmission rate beta uh, to be known. And you can certainly make assumptions on how beta will be in the future. For example, you can say that it's it follows a piecewise linear or based on the, high, no, the based on the previous number of cases, I, I expect it to go like this and that. Or even you can assume that it's fixed. It's a fixed parameter, which is the case in most uh, in, the, in most literature, in most of the work in the literature. But we all know that it changes over time. So 
rather than making this hypothesis on how beta is used, can we learn or estimate it from, from data, like to, from non-pharmaceutical policies? Okay, so of course, one of the main things, uh, main factors that will affect this beta will be the policies that are enforced in the past and in the future. Can we use them to some, somehow estimate beta uh, to then feed it to this SIR model and then get to uh, make uh, predictions? Now, uh, and how can we use these policies? Now, this is one of the places that I would say it's really difficult if you want to make a mechanistic model for modeling the pharmaceutical, non pharmaceutical policies and how they affect. Uh, the, the SIR model. Of course, there have been nice work on this, uh, but like capturing the exact way people interact and abide by non pharmaceutical policies uh, and then relating it to beta, that is, uh, that if you want to do that with a mechanistic model, it definitely comes with certain uh, simplification. Okay, the data we use is similar to the previous one, except that here, instead of mobility, we didn't use past mobility. We just used a certain number of policies. Uh, school closing, work, uh, workplace closing, cancel public events, restrictions on gatherings, uh, close public uh, transport, stay at home requirements, internal movement, uh, international travels. Uh, these are listed by C1 to C8. And there were also some uh, like pop, public information campaigns, testing policies, contact tracing, facial coverings, and protection of elderly people. There were other, like you may ask like, why you don't, didn't use, for example, H7 or other. So uh, there were also vaccinations uh, policies that we didn't include in this uh, work, but uh, there's a follow-up paper that uh, we have integrated uh, vaccinations as well. So this is the data set that we use. You can see the timeline also here for um, different uh, of the different policies. What model did we use? It was uh, an SCIAR model, okay? So susceptible, exposed, infected. So you can see uh, the, an asymptomatic uh, and uh, uh, removed. And you can see the equations here like we considered beta to also be a function of time, but we didn't write down the explicit equation for it. Uh, we have the S I E A here. It's it's kind of a standard way of a standard uh, uh, an extension of uh, to the S I R model. Nothing special. And the parameters. Well, we have here the trend, uh, the transmission rate. I will discuss about it. We don't want to. Uh, dedicated fixed value to it. Uh, total population, we use that. that uh, theta E relative trans, uh, transmissibility, transmissibility of exposed individuals. We got these values from the literature, 0 0.1 and similar one for asymptomatic 0 0.5. Incubation period, 14 days. Population of asymptomatic infections, uh, so pr proportion 0 0.7. We use mu t, which is the death rate of symptomatic infected individuals, which we can easily get from uh, the timelines. And RIRA, recovery rates, uh, which we got from uh, as one over 14. Okay. Uh, so I had a graph for beta here. By the way, this is, I will get back to this slide soon, but this is the beta value, as you can see. Uh, you can see that it's quite fluctuating. And I wouldn't consider a, a piecewise linear model to be a good fit for this. Uh, it also, well, even if it does do a good job in making predictions, uh, you still have to make assumptions like how it will change in the future. It's quite fluctuating. Now, the question is, how can I estimate beta? Well, first, I need a training data set to, to calibrate the value of beta. And for that, what I will do is that uh, we will use the inverse method, uh, which was developed previously by uh, Professor Wang, Hao Wang and colleagues. Uh, we, we just discretize the dynamics and then uh, 
based on the equations that B here is, by the way, the uh, accumulated death, uh, we can obtain beta at time k minus one as a function of other var variables. You see it's based on a, a S at time k, but it doesn't matter because we're not making predictions here. We just want to obtain the value of beta. So by doing this, we can construct a, 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 a training data set, okay? Where we have, we can have the policies and then we can have the beta. We can obtain the beta value for the training data set, for the calibration data set, and then we can uh, feed the model there. Uh, so after making this data set, we will use a generalized boosted model. You can, if you're not familiar with it, just think of it as a extension to uh, decision trees, a more stochastic version of it. And uh, how do we fit beta? Well, the policies in the training data, and by that, I mean these policies that I listed here, uh, we will use them in the time series as the inputs to the model. And the obtained beta that we explained, uh, we just saw how to get it from this inverse method. We will use that as the output, and then we will fit a GBM. And then this, uh, this uh, GBM with its learned parameters, it will be used to make uh, predictions uh, based on the future policies, based on the policy. So the role of this GBM is to estimate the beta, va beta value, and then we will feed it back to the uh, uh, to the to our mechanistic model for making predictions, and here are the results. Uh, so here we use the policies listed here, and uh, they're the same as what I just showed. Uh, 126 days were used for the training. Uh, the, the the graph on the left is uh, the the. The transmission rate, how we obtain that from the training data set. So it's from April 4 to de December 1st, 2020. The blue is the beta obtained from, from the inverse method. The red one is uh, the GBM obtained from the training data set. And the yellow is the predictions on the test. The mean absolute percentage error of the beta value, not the confirmed cases or death was here uh, 40%. So you see that it's not really a, a perfect feat. Uh, we, you can, we can definitely try to improve the feat by, for example, considering you know, different training techniques or different uh, models. We wanted to also to try to keep it as a hypothesis free as possible, but at least it's a good starting point. And then you see that also, even though with this, that uh, like, uh, this level of error that uh, we have in the feeding, when you feed it to the, uh, uh, the mechanistic model, it does a fair job in predicting the future. This is uh, the, the future 35 days, the yellow one, okay? And this is again daily. It's not like weekly average or it's not that. So then what we did was we shifted the, uh, the test data set uh, like one week or uh, a few days in the future. And you see this is, it's more or less capturing the fluctuations, but as it goes further in the future, it becomes a, a more poor fit. Uh, and then you can see that it is, it was able to capture the rays, right? It's going up. It's not like just monotonically going down. And this is because how well it captured this uh, rays in the beta value. Again, please note that the model is not given this blue part. It's estimating this blue part. The yellow is just an estimation from the policies. Just imagine just from the, and the policies, the accuracy in the policies is this. It's not like super accurate. Look, look you're, you're getting from this data, you wanna predict the beta value up to 35 in the future. It's definitely not a straightforward task, but still the, uh, the up and downs that the model was able to capture, like you can see here, the yellow, you see like it's more or less capturing this blue uh, peak. This helped the model to predict that here it needs to raise. And this is more visible here when uh, we increase it to uh, December, 2020. Uh, it, you can see that it is more or less capturing the race here. 
and the MAP here was uh, just 5%. Now, of course, if we would feed the model with mobility data, as we did in the previous work, uh, and uh, by mobility here, I mean like future mobility, uh, then we would get a better fit. But since we wanted to make uh, real predictions, in reality, we never know how uh, mobile people will be in the future. What we know is that what are the policies that will be used in the future? Uh, so the task was to base, base just on the policies to predict the, uh, the transmission rate. Um, this mobility could be, uh, we, it can help in the sense that saying that if we knew the mobility, then uh, how the predictions could be improved. Uh, and we can do a relative influence of the policy variables. And this, these are the results. Like uh, you see the most uh, uh, influential uh, was the restrictions on gatherings. Next was testing policies and so on. Now, uh, here I just want to point though that we definitely cannot make any causal analysis here. Um, yes, the SIR, the the mechanistic models are uh, more or less causal. They are again based on our previous understanding of the of the, the disease spread, which is a causal understanding. But the machine learning part is definitely not causal, so we cannot really make conclusions that you know the most important variable in mitigating the disease spread is restrictions on gatherings, even though this. This practice is again widely used in the literature. Like uh, uh, a data-driven model is obtained, and then immediately after the results, uh, like sensitivity analysis or something like that, is done to say like, okay, the most influential covariate is X. But for doing for making such rigorous conclusions, you really need to uh, uh, to have a causal model, which is not the case here, and. Uh, I'm happy to uh, talk about that if it comes to the, in the questions, but it wasn't the, the scope of this work. Uh, so what did we learn from this part? Uh, well, mechanistic models are absolutely intuitive most of the time, and they are powerful in short-term predictions. Why are they powerful in short-term predictions? Because they typically assume that the parameters are time invariant, and that is a valid, assumption for a short period of time, okay? But they typically fail in predicting the mid to long range for the future, okay? And uh, the reason is exactly as what I said, like uh, making assumptions on, uh, on the variables such as data. Now, uh, machine learning models are powerful in capturing non-intuitive patterns, patterns that may not be easily uh, Either uh, catch by uh, either caught by eye, or they can be easy. For example, the task of face recognition, right? Uh, it is intuitive, but writing a mechanistic model for that is uh, very difficult, if not close to impossible. So they are capable in capturing patterns, but they are not, they are a black box design, and uh, that's really. Uh, causes the uh, the question the biologists or mathematical biologists to all uh, often question these models, and uh, the reason is they are merely based on data. Of course, there are extensions where you, uh, human expert knowledge is also incorporated, but the the common trend there is to if you want to get better predictions, most of the time you will just let the the model to decide which variables to choose, which model to choose, which feature uh, ordering to choose, and all of that only based on data. Uh, now, a proper mixture of the two can definitely uh, uh, be a, the key to improving our mechanistic models. How? Well, by using the mechanistic models for those parts that uh, the dynamics are well understood, like what we did here in the SCIR model, and then the machine learning parts for those that are still not well understood or for the time varying parameters of uh, of the model from data. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the uh, uh, the many colleagues that I was uh, grateful to work with. Uh, 
uh, Professor Ross Rainer, uh, uh, Arzu Haratian, Professor Luis, uh, Mark Luis, uh, uh, Zainab Maliki, Arash Mario Riyad, Naya Mithadi, uh, Kiangu Na, and Roberto Vega, Hal Wang, Shunan Wang, and David Wishart from uh, different universities. Thanks, that's all, and I'm happy to answer questions. <laughs>